It sure did take long enough to get a feature-length documentary on the Velvet Underground, but better late than never. This is the first documentary from filmmaker Todd Haynes, whose previous work has been fictional, much of it inspired by rock musicians. Films like Velvet Goldmine, loosely based on David Bowie and Iggy Pop, and I'm Not There, where different actors portrayed different versions of Bob Dylan. His breakthrough film was one in which he told the story of Karen Carpenter using Barbie dolls. There was a lawsuit over the use of Carpenter's music, so unfortunately it's been banned from distribution. The Velvet Underground, though they only existed long enough to create four studio albums, have been solidified as one of the most influential bands of the 20th century. The Velvet Underground were songwriter and guitar player Lou Reed, violin and bass player John Cale, guitar player Sterling Morrison, drummer Maureen Tucker, and for one album, model and actress Nico, who had recently been featured in Federico Fellini's three-hour masterpiece La Dolce Vita. Doug Yule would replace John Cale for the third and fourth albums, and by the last album, contributions from Mo Tucker and Sterling Morrison had diminished. In 1970, Lou Reed left the band and began a successful solo career, essentially breaking up the group. There was a reunion in the 90s that the documentary briefly mentions near the end in a montage scene, which is fine because usually a band's reunion many years later isn't really all that interesting in terms of storytelling. Because so many people involved have since passed, many of the interviews included are archival sound clips. Lou Reed, Nico, Sterling Morrison, Andy Warhol, and Tony Conrad have all passed at this point, so interviews with them are minimal. This is a shame as I'd like to hear more interview clips from these artists in the film. The major interview clips are with John Cale and fewer from Maureen Tucker. Doug Yule, who appeared on the third and fourth albums as Cale's replacement, declined to be in the film. Drone music pioneer Lamont Young and his wife are interviewed, but only a few clips are included. The interviews with avant-garde composers of drone music like Tony Conrad and Lamont Young are included early in the film to set up John Cale and the more experimental element that he brought to the band. A young John Cale is shown on an old television program talking about a piece by French composer Eric Satie, Vexations, which is meant to be played for 18 hours looping 840 times. All of the normies are looking at him like he's completely insane. John Cage, who influenced John Cale, was really the father of 20th century avant-garde musical compositions, most known for his piece 433, which is 4 minutes and 33 seconds of complete silence, in which the sounds of the environment are the music. In the same vein, drone music can replicate the hum of the city, the ever-present noisy rumblings of modern society. The documentary mainly focuses on the formation of the band and the recording of the first album. The band's second album, White Light, White Heat, is a short and extremely noisy album, providing the listener with the experience of being strung out on stimulants. A more abrasive and caustic record than the debut, with a sound more true to the band's live performances. The documentary really glosses over the third and fourth albums, which are albums I love. I might even like these albums more than White Light, White Heat because they return to more conventional songwriting. But as John Cale left the group after the second record, it's a major shakeup for the band's sound. Lou made a, uh, an ultimatum that either he or John would have to go. Lou sent me over here to tell you that um, he told the rest of us that if John goes, I don't go. And that was it. Doug Yule was brought in to replace Cale, even taking lead vocals on the crushingly beautiful Candy Says, the intro to the third album. Perhaps from a documentary perspective, there's not as much to say about the band for the third and fourth records, especially with no Doug Yule interviews. But I would have liked to hear more interviews with other artists talking about these records and their influence. I've always heard that the third record was recorded in this acoustic, mellow way because the band had all of their equipment stolen. They don't mention this anywhere in the documentary. The fourth album is the most classic rock they ever sounded. 
Loaded gave us bangers such as Rock and Roll and Sweet Jane, alongside the epic closer Oh Sweet Nothing, the closest the band ever came to a Hey Jude style anthem. The style of the documentary imitates and pays tribute to the pop art style that Andy Warhol was known for, as well as the experimental short films of filmmakers such as Kenneth Anger, Jack Smith, Maya Darren, and Jonas Mikas, whose film clips are used to provide context and engaging imagery during voiceover interviews. There's a split screen format in some of the earlier sections where a band member's name flashes up on one side while another band member's story is being told on the other side. This split screen style is an homage to the three hour Andy Warhol film Chelsea Girls, which I find to be borderline unwatchable. Chelsea Girls is like watching a bunch of raw footage of people just hanging out at the factory having long, drawn out, boring conversations with really poor audio quality. Twerk. What am I, a bird? Mongoloid. A bowel penetration, my dear. Anal penetration, vaginal penetration. Vaginal what penetration. What happened? You're not allowed to have it, you never will be. You don't need me on you. You're a hell. 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 I'm telling you. I can barely understand what anyone is saying, and I can't even tell what I'm looking at. Then there's another person hanging out on the other side of the screen, having a conversation without any audio at all. I've never been able to make it through this film. Back to the Velvet Underground documentary, they used a lot of paneling with images, a dozen different videos all playing out at once like a wall of televisions. I wonder how long it took to edit and render all of that footage moving at different speeds. It provides a really visually appealing compliment to the voiceover which pays tribute to the style of experimental films. Now I actually enjoy the movies that Warhol associate Paul Morrissey directed, Flesh, Trash, and Heat, as well as Flesh for Frankenstein and Blood for Dracula. Then there are Andy Warhol films like Empire which is a camera filming the Empire State Building for 24 hours. Or Kiss, it's people kissing for like 40 minutes, just shot after shot of people kissing, kissing in all kinds of ways. Kiss was followed by films such as Eat, Sleep, and Blowjob. Can you guess what those movies were about? It's not like something you watch for engagement, it's something you imagine is being played in the background at some hip club. On the other hand, Chelsea Girls has dialogue and was released in theaters, making it hard to understand who the target audience was. People on drugs, I guess. The first 45 minutes of the documentary set up the early stages of the band, the popularity of doo-wop, the rise of Bob Dylan, and the avant-garde New York art scene of the 1960s. All of these factor into the creation of the Velvet Underground. Lou Reed was listening to pop music and was an aspiring Dylan-esque singer-songwriter, while John Cale was experimenting with drone music and dissonant violin playing. The marriage of these two extremes under the roof of Andy Warhol's factory is what gave us that first iconic Velvet Underground Banana album, the poster that's sitting right behind me because it's one of my favorite albums of all time. Mo Tucker's simple and primal drumming style complemented the gritty, and grimy subject matter well. I'm Waiting for My Man and Heroin are both songs that highlight the loneliness, insecurity, and desperation of the drug addict always trapped in search of the next fix. Venus in Furs with its line, Taste the Whip, Now Bleed for Me, characterizes the BDSM fetishes of an underground sex club. All Tomorrow's Parties mocks the high fashion hipster scene in which the Velvet Underground existed as part of, but also apart from. The Velvet Underground seem somewhat detached from the very scene that gave them life. The decision to bring in fashion model and actress Nico gave the band another key element that shaped the sound of this legendary album. Her deadpan delivery of the lyrics in a voice deeper than Lou Reed's on songs like Femme Fatale and I'll Be Your Mirror are perfect. I agree with Maureen Tucker when she says that if Lou Reed sang these songs, they wouldn't have been on the same level. Her voice doesn't need a lot of range or technical proficiency to convey a sense of deep and tortured sadness. Nico's vocal performances are mysterious, unique, and instantly recognizable. European Sun, with its abstract and obtuse lyrics, 
closes the album out, sounding like a car spinning out of control by the end, with the sounds of broken glass, staccato-picked notes, and abrasive feedback boiling all together into absolute chaos. A primordial soup of sound that goes on for seven and a half minutes. It's a magnificent closer compared to the sleepy hangover days of Sunday morning that kicks the album off. The film features a lot of these songs prominently, that's why I figured I'd talk about them a little. When you look at many classic rock bands of the time, it's generally all dudes. Though the Velvet Underground had two female members, providing a greater variety of personality and vocal performance within the band. Nico left the band after the first album, though she put out some great solo records that became increasingly more bizarre. The Marble Index, Desert Shore, and The End. Her album Chelsea Girls, not to be confused with the film, is an accessible introduction to her music, with songs written by Jackson Brown, Bob Dylan, and Lou Reed, all men she was romantically involved with at some point. In one interview, Lou Reed's former bandmate criticizes the poetry that Lou Reed was writing at the time about men having sex in bathrooms. He calls it degrading. I don't personally think that poetry that describes gay hookups in public places is degrading. It's actually what was forward thinking and revolutionary about Lou Reed's lyrics, describing sex and drugs in explicit terms where rock music up to this point had to encode the language to get on the radio. The film opens with a quote from French poet Charles Baudelaire, music fathoms the sky. Lou Reed's lyrics are definitely influenced by the works of Baudelaire and Jean Genet, which explored at the time taboo subject matter such as homosexuality and the life of sex workers. Nowadays, singing about sex and drugs is not going to keep you off the radio, but there had to be pioneers like Lou Reed to write a song called Heroin, one of his earliest songs, to push forward the conversation. The song isn't an endorsement of drug use at all. It's a stream of consciousness rant from the perspective of an addict who lies strung out daydreaming about escaping to another time in history because his life in the city is so miserable. He trails off with the phrase, and I guess that I just don't know, at the end of every lyrical buildup, the disaffected mantra of the opiate addict. He was like a three-year-old in many ways. I said, you can sing and you're a shitty guitar player anyway, so you'll be covered. He had a tremendous track record of being high, of, of being sick. It's good that they provide an opinion on Lou Reed that isn't hero worship, showing his flaws, but it's times like this I wish we could get more Lou Reed interviews to understand his perspective. We do get a good amount of interviews with Jonathan Richman from The Modern Lovers, who started out as a VU fanboy and, along with bands like Sonic Youth, carried on the legacy of the Velvet Underground style. I also would have liked to hear more from John Waters, as they sat him down for an interview but only used a small section in the film. One of my favorite quotes comes from Mo Tucker when she's describing the clash between the dark and cynical music that came from the Velvet Underground, and the peace and love movement coming out of California at the time. You cannot change minds by handing a flower to some bozo who wants to shoot you. It's interesting to contrast the bright and sunny music of the Mamas and the Papas with the raw and dire music of the Velvet Underground. I've never been a fan of the Mamas and the Papas, and after the accusations came out against John Phillips by his daughter in 2009, I felt vindicated in my opinion of their music. The Velvet Underground were singing about sex and drugs, sure, but the Mamas and the Papas were the real sleazy hippies. Some family members have pushed back against the allegations made against John Phillips, but we're here to talk about the Velvet Underground, not the Mamas and the Papas. Fuck that band. Nico, like Lou Reed, was a longtime heroin addict. Though she had used methadone to overcome the habit, Sadly, she passed away in a biking accident in 1988 at the age of 49. The year prior, Andy Warhol passed away at the age of 58 after undergoing gallbladder surgery. Sterling Morrison died in 1995 of lymphoma, though Lou Reed lived to be 71 when he succumbed to liver cancer in 2013. This brings me back to my main criticism of the film, that a Velvet Underground documentary should have been made while Lou Reed was still alive though perhaps he was uninterested in the idea. This is still a great introduction to the Velvet Underground, even if it's not the deep dive I wanted, 
It's not like the Beatles get back where you had the most popular band in the world with cameras around them for hours at a time. The Velvet Underground existed under the radar for a short yet important period of time in the 1960s in a scene where creating art was the priority, even if only about 10 people initially bought the album. I'll go 8 out of 10 for the Velvet Underground documentary as a loving tribute to the band as well as the artists and filmmakers that defined the 1960s scene in New York. I was interested in communicating to people who were on the outside 